Well, hi, my name is Erica. And in case you don't know who I am, I am married to our lead pastor here at uh, Ridgefield Church, Pastor Jason. And I am not a public speaker. I don't do this very often. It's not my favorite thing to do. It is something that takes me completely outside my comfort zone. But Jason has asked me multiple times to speak on Mother's Day. And then he had this opportunity to go fishing and and hunting in Alaska, and so I finally said yes. And so, if you want to give him crud for leaving me on Mother's Day to do this, that, that, that is completely fine with me. I think he kind of deserves that. No. No, I also think he deserves this trip. He, he works really hard, and I'm very proud of him. So, I'm glad. And if you've never heard him speak, you should come back and hear him speak next week. Um, like many of you, I have mixed feelings about Mother's Day. I, uh, I love Mother's Day because I am a mother, and I, my awesome kids always do a good job trying to make me feel special. They have a bunch of gifts waiting for me lined up on the fireplace, so when I get home, I can get to open those up. They do whatever they can. Olivia did chores for me last night. It was awesome. They always do things like that. I love to uh, spend Mother's Day reflecting on the amazing women around me and, um, and the women that have invested in me, and I think that's really special. But uh, in my adult years, I had a very conflicted relationship with my own mom, and um, she passed away nine years ago. And so sometimes Mother's Day makes me think about my losses and the things I, I missed out on. And so I know, I know um, the women in here have all kinds of mixed feelings, men too, um, about Mother's Day. And I just want to say that wherever you are in those feelings, I'm glad you're here, and I pray that God says something to you today. As you may have heard, living life in a pastor's family is sometimes described as living life in a fishbowl. They talk about how a lot of times as a pastor's family, people can see and they're watching from every angle what you do. They have expectations of, of what life is supposed to look like um, and what, how pastor's families are supposed to act. Uh, I work really hard to make sure I don't bring that into my parenting. And you've probably seen Easton throw a fit sometimes, and that's just because I work really hard at just letting us, let my kids be kids. And um, I really don't think about this fishbowl concept very often until someone makes a comment to me. And uh, I have an example of one. Um, one day we were at a party, and Easton was probably two or three years old, I think, and he was tired. He was done with people. It was getting late, and it was hot, and it was crowded, and he threw a toddler tantrum. Have any of your toddlers ever thrown a tantrum? <laughs> yes, right? All toddlers do. Well, he was in my arms probably, and like, you know, like trying to throw himself out of my arms as he was throwing a fit, and... I had a mom walk over to me, and she said, I'm so glad your son's throwing a tantrum. And I looked at her, and I have no idea what my face said, probably something not very nice. But um, I finally asked her why she would say such a thing, and she said, because seeing a pastor's son throw a fit makes her feel normal, and like, her kids are normal. And so I was like, okay took me a minute, I thought about what she said, and I realized in that moment that if people are watching what we do, then we're just going to be our real authentic selves. If we can normalize struggles for people, then that's what we're going to try to do. And so if you know us, that's how we live. We're just, we're just ourselves. And um, one, of the, one of the neatest things about moving here to Ridgefield has been having a very special lady who knows what it's like to raise kids in a pastor's family. Frida has been very honest about what it was like raising Rick and Randy, and it's been very fun to hear some of the stories. And so today, I'm going to invite her up, and we're going to share some stories about what it's like to raise kids in a pastor's family. So welcome, Frida. Thanks, Frida. Thanks for doing this with me. So, Frida has two boys, right, and they're adults now, and they attend church here. And, uh, oh, there's one of them right there in the front row. There. 
So, Frida, were you always in the ministry while raising kids? Yes, I was. Uh, Rick was born um, in June, and a week after he was born, we moved to um, a little town called Orangevale, where my husband was a youth pastor. And uh, so, yes, we've been in ministry. That's awesome. Um, So we're going to start with some funny stories. So I'm going to let you go ahead and open and share one about Randy. Okay. Uh, This happened right here in uh, Ridgefield. Uh, One of the very first, I think it was the first soccer team that my son was on. Uh, He brought home some of the world's finest chocolate candy bars to sell. And he did really well on that first box of selling those candy bars. I was real proud of him. But the second box just sat there. And I finally said, Randy, you either need to sell those candy bars or take them back to your coach. And I looked a little closer at that box. And I noticed that candy bar at the top had a bite out of it. And I thought, whoa, that's strange. So I picked up the box. And I, and I looked at the next one. All 15 candy bars had one bite taken out of it. <laughs> And I said, Randy, why why do these have a bite out of them? And he says, well, I just kind of thought I could sell them and they wouldn't notice. (laughs) (laughs) But I think he got to thinking about it and he realized they would notice. So Randy was my saver. And even though he was a little tiny boy, he saved his money. I took him to the bank, and he pulled out $15, which was just about killed him. And he paid for those candy bars. And for 30 school lunches, he had a half a candy bar. That's so awesome. (laughs) That's so awesome. Well, one of our parenting fails was, uh, fails. Um, Easton loved wheels when he was little. He would discover wheels everywhere. He found them on cars. He realized our dishwasher had wheels. He, you know, the grill had wheels. He found wheels everywhere. And um, his favorite thing to do was to sit in our car and to pretend like he was driving, you know, with the steering wheel. And um, have, you ever, have you ever let your kids sit behind the steering wheel and pretend like they're driving? They love doing that. I, I think when Easton was like two years old, he was, he was pretending to drive our car and he was sitting in it. And Jason and I we're in the kitchen, and Olivia runs in, and she's like, Mom, Dad, Easton's driving the car. We're like, we know, he's sitting in there. She's like, no, he's driving the car. And we're like, what? And we look out the window, and we see the Volvo, like, sl- you know, like, sliding back down out of the driveway. And Easton is in there. We run out, in the, you know, run out, and Easton's in there just smiling. He's like, this is fun, man. This thing is moving. And I was very thankful that our driveway had like an uphill, so it stopped the car from rolling very much further. But he, he, he thought it was awesome. Rick did the very same thing. And it was a very steep hill on a very busy road, but uh, did God Rick, protected him. Well, that's good. I'm glad you're still here, Rick. That's good. Yeah, we're glad So you're... did the car get damaged? No, no oh, damage. Oh, that's good. That's good. You want to share, share your uh, liver story? Yeah. Somebody in our church was so generous. They went deer hunting, and uh, they, they liked the deer meat, but they didn't like the liver, so they gave it to us. <laughs> <laughs> so generous, right? Yes. And so I cooked up that liver, and uh, we were sitting around the table, and I took a bite, and I thought, this is awful. It was just awful. I said, I thought to myself, I can't make these boys eat this liver. I don't even want to eat it. So I cut a little piece and I got their attention when their dad wasn't looking. And I said, watch this. And I put it under the table for our dog to eat. So the, all the three of us, we fed our liver to the dog and my husband ate his liver. <laughs> <laughs> and then afterwards, He said, those boys really did good eating their liver. And then we had a nice laugh, and uh, we confessed. (laughs) That's awesome. That's awesome. Well, um, my next story had nothing to do with my parenting. It was all Jason. So I was at work, and Jason was busy at home, and Olivia was, uh, I don't know, maybe one and a half, and she kind of liked to splash around in the toilet. So... I, I learned to, 
I learned to keep the door shut. You know, when I was, moms just prevent things from happening, right? We just get smart. Well, Jason was home with Olivia, and he was trying to get the printer to work and get ready for Sunday service, and he was busy, and, and uh, he didn't close the door. And so Olivia got into the bathroom and was splashing around. And he thought to himself, this is what a dad would think maybe, well, as long as she's splashing, she's alive. So he, he just let her play in the toilet for a while. He's like, I'm going to have to give her a bath anyway. So she splashed around. And eventually he heard, Dad, help. And he came into the bathroom, and this is what it looked like. She was, she was stuck in the toilet. And so he had to help her. He was like, wait, i got to get the camera. Took a picture of it. but <laughs> Took a picture of it. So I know. It was precious. But you have a toilet story too, don't you? Uh, yes, I do. Uh, <laughs> uh, when Rick was two years old, he was potty trained, and uh, he, um, we were in a store with my mother-in-law, and kind of a hardware store, and uh, Helen and I, we were looking at something, and we heard this little sound over here, and my son was using the display toilet. <laughs> And I remember thinking, I just want to close the lid and run. <laughs> but then I realized, OK, you're the pastor's wife. That wouldn't be a very good example. And you're a Christian. So I had to go up and tell them. But uh, I never went back to that store. <laughs> <laughs> For sure not. For sure not. So Frida, has parenting always been easy for you? Well. Parenting has been a joy to me. It's been a joy, and I, I've loved it. However, it's always been very, it has had times of challenge. Yeah. And uh, uh, there's been many times I've had to pray and, and just ask God for help and strength and direction. And uh, I, I know what we're leading up to. We're, we're leading up to a time I was very frustrated as a mother. I felt, I felt like I was just nagging, nagging, pick this up, pick that up, please put that away, you know, just constant. And, and finally, I, I talked to my husband and I said, honey, I think it seems like my boys only want to do what they feel like doing. So here's my plan. And he said, oh, honey, you'll never be able to do that. Well, that was just enough to make me determine to do it. <laughs> so what I did is I set my boys down, and I said, OK, listen, guys, it seems to me like you only want to do around here what you feel like doing. So that's what we're all going to do. I'm only going to do what I feel like doing, too. And they thought it was pretty great. Man, no chores. Boy, they were going to get just kind of do what they wanted and, uh, until dinner time came. And one of them came into the bedroom, and I was laying on the bed and reading and just having a great, relaxing time. And he said, what's for dinner? And I go, I don't feel like cooking dinner. I, I'm just doing what I feel like doing. And right now, I feel like reading and going out to dinner with your dad later. <laughs> and so I said, but uh, I had just purchased 10 packages of turkey hot dogs. They were a dollar a package. And they tasted like they were a dollar a package. They were awful. <laughs> but I said, if you feel like it, you could cook yourself some hot dogs. And uh, so that was kind of the beginning of our adventure. Uh, I remember uh, one of them coming in, uh, my youngest one, Randy, he, was, he had these dirty clothes on, and they were wrinkled. And, Mom, I don't have any clothes for school. And I said, I'm sorry, I don't feel like doing laundry, but if you feel like it, you can. And it just caught, you know, for two weeks we played that game of we're out of ketchup and we're out of mustard and we're out of, I'm sorry, I don't feel like getting groceries. And uh, at one time, one really kind of funny moment, yeah, I, I cooked some uh, fried chicken and potatoes and gravy and, you know, all their favorite things, and, but I only fixed it for two because I only felt like fixing it for two of us. <laughs> and I, I remember them, them walking by and looking at that and going, and I, oh, you know, it's too bad we only feel like doing, you know, we only do what we feel like doing because if you felt like contributing to this family, you'd be sitting at this table. <laughs> and uh, so it was kind of a, kind of a, it's kind of a funny memory now, but uh, finally they went to their dad and they said, how do we get mom back? <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> and I, his words, well, before we even talk to her, you better clean this house up. And let me tell you, I was so afraid our district superintendent or somebody was going to come over <laughs> that, that literally the garbage trash was just overflowing and every dish in the house was just on the sink and dirty. And so those boys cleaned up the house. And uh, oh, one other really funny thing I want to share, we had the Harvest Festival during that time, and those boys were so excited. They got to go to the Harvest Festival, festival and they were going to eat something, <laughs> and they had hot dogs, so. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, that, uh, that's kind of one, of one of my attempts at yeah. helping them see how they needed to contribute to the family. Yeah. So did your mom strike work? You know, I'm not sure it did. I know it did <laughs> some because I, from then on, they did their own laundry. Oh, there you go. Yeah. There you go. That's good. Well, parenting isn't always hard, right? There's some special moments, too. Yes. Absolutely. So, um, do, uh, I'll, I'll, I guess I'll start with one. Um, uh, I'll start with the one about Olivia. So, when Olivia was like in third or fourth grade, we, our church was doing... That's Easton. Um, our church was doing, I switched on you a laugh from last night, sorry. Um, our church was doing a kindness challenge, and we were seeing how many people in our community we could impact with acts of kindness. And a teacher in Olivia's school had cancer. And so she was like, I am going to make her a basket. And so we took her to the grocery store, and she picked out all these things. And, and uh, we prayed over that basket, and she took it to school to give to that teacher who, was, who had cancer and was sick. And so I was really proud of her in, the, in that moment. It made me, did my, my mom heart good. So. I think one of my fondest memories of Rick was when he was probably five or six years old. And we lived in Live Oak at that time. Uh, we lived right next to the high school. And uh, across the street was kind of a rowdy group of teenagers often and I you know this mother protective heart I saw him over there talking to them one day and I just wanted to you know yank him out of there and protect him so I told him to come home but he, he came home but he brought uh, a young man with him his name was Donald Parks and he says mom he says I was just telling Don maybe Jesus lives in his heart but maybe he's just knocking at his heart's door and that little boy led this kid, this teenage boy, to Jesus. And Donald was part of our church for quite a while. And um, I, th that's a fond memory. For sure. Very fun. For sure. And that, this Easter, Easton was, said, everybody needs to come to church on Easter. And so he asked for flyers to invite all the kids in his class to the Easter egg hunt and to church on, on Easter. And so he was super excited when, when two of the kids from his class came to the Easter egg hunt. And uh, it just made me very proud that he cared enough about those kids in his class around him to, to invite them. And so there's a picture with Easton with one of his classmates. So, yeah. Well, thank you, Frida, for sharing. Everybody, let's give Frida a round of applause. She does, she does good. She's going to come back up here in a little bit. Thank you. So... Just to make sure you don't have any notion that we have it all together, we wanted to share some of those parenting stories with you, or parenting fails, I guess, some of them. Um, and we wanted to also add that most of you are so amazing at accepting us as who we are, and you allow us to try new things and make mistakes, and we really appreciate that because it allows us to grow and to keep being creative and be ourselves. So we really do appreciate that. Um, so most of what I'm going to be sharing with you today is what I've been learning on my personal journey over the last few months. One of my favorite subjects to learn about is people. I studied psychology and counseling in school. I love to read books about spiritual gifts and personality types. Um, I love to talk to people and listen to what people have to say. It's just one of my favorite things to do. And recently, in a book I was reading, the author said something like, um, we can really learn about who God is when we get to know people because we are all made in God's image. We all reflect part of God's personality and part of his character. Um, God is the perfect version of that personality and character trait, all those character traits, and we are definitely not. But we can still see glimpses of who God is as we watch the people around us. And so, as I started to think about what I wanted to say on 
this Mother's Day, um, I started to pay attention to the women around me. And I can think, I just think that we can see part of who God is when we watch the women around us. And one of, the, one of the things I noticed was that the women around me, they give and they work and they do it day in and day out. I admire the women around me who make a second meal so that they can deliver an extra to a friend who's just had surgery or just needs a break. I admire the women who have brought extra kids into their home and who love them with their whole hearts. I admire the women who put their own ambitions aside so that they can raise their kids and uh, work in the family business. I admire the women who have started businesses and who work outside their homes so that they can support their families. I admire the women who take care of their parents and their in-laws. I admire the women who encourage or mentor other women who are younger than themselves. I admire the women who serve in our church, in our schools, and in our community, reflecting the character of Jesus wherever they go. I want you to take a minute and to think about the women who love you by cleaning, cooking, working, shopping, picking up the house, laundry, laundry, chauffeuring, organizing, hugging, changing diapers, cleaning vomit, scrubbing baseball pans, checking homework, staying up late, getting up early, and the next day they get up and do it all over again. The women around you are amazing. <clears throat> and I've been reflecting a lot on the love, love that God has for us as I, as I watch the women around me. And I've also been paying attention to how much perseverance they show. And I think that watching them will help us, and their perseverance will help us learn about God's character. And so, we are going to read a passage. It's a passage that um, we've heard lots of times, but God's been using it to teach me some new things. And so, we're going to read Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 3. And it says... Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles, and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of, God, right hand of the throne of God, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. Before I get started on this, uh, diving into this passage, I just want to uh, disclose something to you. I hate running. I hate it. I hate it a lot. <laughs> I've always hated it. In fact, in PE in high school, I refused to run the mile and took a lower grade in PE. And that was really hard for me to do because I cared about my grades. That's how much I do not like to run. I have a lot of runner friends that I admire a lot, but I'm going on a race with a bunch of them as the driver. I'm like, not running. I will not run. I just don't, I don't like to run. So when I read this passage about running, it makes me tired from the start, and it kind of makes me resistant, and I just don't like to think about it. But um, but God's been using it in my life. And then we read the phrase, run with perseverance, and that sounds really long and hard, doesn't it? So, and I'm one of those people that likes to know, like, how long something's going to take or how hard something's going to be. Like, when we go on a hike, I'm always asking Jason, what's it like? How hard is it going to be? What do I need to bring? And it drives him crazy. He's like, we're just going on a hike. And I'm like, I want to know all these things before we go. Well, we don't have any of those answers when we think about the run that we're going to be running that's described in Hebrews chapter 12, which is why I believe God's been work using those verses uh, to help me learn some things. Like running can be hard, and obeying God can be hard. Many of you are in the middle of hard things. So I think God has some things to teach us. So we're going to dive into this passage. The first part says... Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, 
Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. First, this passage indicates that we are surrounded by a bunch of cheerleaders. There are a bunch of cheerleaders in heaven. How cool is that to think about? There are a bunch of people who are up in heaven already who have run their race well and who are cheering you on and want you to run your race well. Some of those people might be your mothers or grandmothers, and I just think that's really kind of cool to think about on this Mother's Day. And now that we know we have cheerleaders, we're going to dive into the rest of of this verse. It says, Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles. What are the sins that so easily entangle? I think these might be the sins that we don't think about very much. I think that there are a lot of sins or behaviors that we, we find it easy to avoid. There's things that we just know we're not going to do. Like, I know I'm not going to murder someone, and I know I'm not going to rob a bank. There are just things that I know I'm not going to do. In fact, growing up, I uh, grew up in a Christian family, and I was given a list of things I should do, you know, the do's, and a list of things I should not do, the don'ts, right? And I always thought that as long as I avoided that list of don'ts, that I was avoiding sin. But as I grew in my faith, I started to realize that there was a lot of things in my heart and in my life that God wanted to work on that had nothing to do with that list of don'ts. And, uh, and so that's been part of my journey and, and things that he, uh, there's a lot of things that he's been working on in my heart about. One, of the, one example of that is patience. Um, one of my Easter posts said something, I think this was several years ago when my kids were younger, it said something like, um, there's nothing better than getting kids ready for church on Easter Sunday morning to make you realize your need for a savior, <laughs> right? It's like, I can tell that I must have had a chaotic morning that morning trying to get the kids ready for Easter Sunday and that I must have lost my cool at some point. And, you know, I think that God has used my kids in a lot of ways to help, help um, work on the issues that are, were kind of in my heart, the heart that needed to be dealt with. And um, he's probably using your kids too. Now, he's worked with me on patience, and I have gotten a lot better. Or my, maybe it's just because my kids have gotten older. I don't know. No, I really do think he's worked with, pa- with me on patience. And I'm not perfect, but um, he's definitely helped me in that area of my life. So what are the sins that entangle your heart? They may not be outward sins, but sins of the heart, like jealousy or pride or bitterness. I even heard on a podcast this last week that, that um, being sl- too slow to obey God with something he's telling you to do is a sin. And I'm like, I thought that was interesting because... And it makes sense because when my kids don't obey me and do what I say when I say it, I get frustrated and upset. And so it makes sense that if God's telling you to do something and you're being slow to act, that 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 could be a sin that you need to deal with. So this verse tells us what to do with those sins. It says, throw them off. Get Get rid of them. Pray about them. Don't just set them aside, but throw it with some force. Get them out of your life. Just like a runner would never run a marathon wearing ankle weights, we have to deal with the sins in our lives if you want to persevere. The next part of our verse in Hebrews Hebrews 12, 1 says, And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So this part of the verse says, Do something. Run, right? As, an, a doer, um, as a doer or an achiever by personality, um, I like this part. I, not that it's running, but I like the action part. I like to take action. Um, in fact, I'm so impressed with the obedience I see in some of the women around me. Um, and I love to watch how God's using them. And so that motivates me to keep trying things, to do stuff. I'm so, I am someone who... Um, has always been trying to do something for God. In fact, I think I would always have said, uh, I want to do something great for God. 
But unfortunately, I would let that, that thought paralyze me at times because I wouldn't know what that great thing was that God wanted me to do. And then I heard this quote, and it helped me. Um, it said, Instead of trying to do great things for God, start doing things for a great God. And, um, and that helped me shift how I look at, look at what I do. And, and so I just have started to act and try things. And I think we all just need to act and let, the outcome, let God handle the outcomes. We just need to take action, run. We can just ask somebody to coffee, and he can use that. God can use that. We can offer to babysit, and God can use that. We can serve somewhere on Sunday mornings, and God can use that. We just need to start doing things for our great God. I've heard some people talking as they talk about their full potential and trying to figure out what their full potential looks like. And Jason and I, you know, they'll be confused. They don't know what to do. And so Jason and I a lot of times say, our suggestion is usually try something, do something, and see if it's the right fit, right? Sometimes it's just, we just have to start, start uh, trying things and allow God to work in our hearts and to change us. And, um, and that's just the process he uses to help us get to our full potential. So our great God can use anything we try to do. One of the things I keep coming across in books is the importance of the women of God to mother the motherless. There are women in our church who don't have good relationships with their moms. There are also women in our church who have lost their moms, whose moms have passed away. In fact, when I was first married, I didn't feel like I could call my mom for things because I never knew what that was going to bring about. A phone call was really hard with her. And so I had these two ladies in our church who, who would answer my questions about cooking. They taught me how to make fried chicken. You know, um, they taught me about parenting. Uh, they taught me how to organize event, an event for church. They taught me how to orchestrate an entire VBS. And uh, those women spending that time and investing in me has given me the confidence to try a lot of things through my life, and I'm so thankful that they did. And so I'm wondering today if there is anyone God might put in your mind as someone that you could invest in. We're going to keep, keep going. And in verse 2, it talks about how we can keep going with perseverance. It says, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the perfecter of faith. So this is how we persevere. We fix our eyes on Jesus. According to some research I've done about running, not experience I've had about running, but research I've done, you should look at the ground about 10 to 20 feet ahead of where you're running. And you have to keep focused on where you're going. In a book I read recently about, um, well, it was about ministry, Kay Warren described keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus with a great word picture. She said something like this. She said, imagine you're running a race, and you're running the best you know how. And you are focused on the finish line, and you are avoiding every hole in the ground. Then as you run along, someone in the crowd starts to yell and say mean things to you. They say something like, you run funny, or your shoes are ugly, or they say, you should just quit and give up. Well, in that moment, you have a choice. You can keep your eyes fixed on where you're going, or you can turn and look at the crowd to figure out who's making those comments. Chances are, if you turn and look, you're going to stumble and fall on your face. We can't focus on the critiques and criticisms of others. Again, I want you to imagine you're running a race, and you are running the best you know how, and you're doing awesome, and you're keeping your eyes fixed on, on where you're going, and someone in the crowd cheers for you, and they say, great job, you're doing awesome, and they compliment your shoes. They say, they're so awesome. And, and you're just, you know, you're running. In that moment, you have a choice. You can keep your eyes fixed on where you're going, or you can turn and look to see who is making those, those nice comments. Well, in that same way, if you turn your face and stop looking at where you're going, you most likely will stumble and fall on your face. 
We can't focus on pleasing others. I'll also add that if you're running and you're looking at your own feet and you're going along trying to stare at your own shoes, you'll most likely stumble and fall or you'll look up and take a tree branch to the face, right? We can't focus on ourselves. So I've learned that keeping my eyes focused on Jesus is this. It means not getting sidetracked by the negative things people say. It means not being motivated to please others. And it means not staying focused on yourselves. It means running towards Jesus, focusing on getting to know him, and living out the mission that he's called you to. Keeping your eyes fixed on Jesus is the only way to finish our race. But don't let that churchy phrase uh, minimize the effort it's going to take. Let's continue reading our passage. It says, the last part of verse 2 says, For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Did you catch that part? For the joy set before him, he endured the cross. I had never really thought about that, that part of that passage before this last Easter. I had never thought about Jesus having joy as he endured the cross. Jesus was motivated by joy as he approached the cross. How difficult would that have been? I don't know about you, but I think it's really hard sometimes to look past the things I'm sacrificing and the hard work I'm doing to look at the joys that may come down the road. What joys would have been enough for Jesus to endure the cross? Maybe he saw you. Maybe he saw me. Maybe he saw your faces and he knew that someday he would be in relationship with you. And he thought that was enough to help him endure the cross. Also in verse 2, it says this. He stayed focused on returning to the throne in heaven. He says, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So he's, he's focused on sitting down at the right hand of God. He's focused on returning to heaven. Is it possible that we can focus on joy even when our race is hard? I think so. We can look ahead to see what outcomes might come out of our hard work and sacrifices. When I think about my adult kids, or my kids being adults someday, and a lot of your kids being adults someday, and following Jesus, I think any amount of work that I'm doing right now is worth it. And that, that just brings me joy and motivates me to keep going. In our last verse, it says this, Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. In order to finish our race, we need to consider Jesus. Think about what he did and how he finished his race. We have to get to know him well and keep our eyes fixed on him. We have to get rid of any sin that might be holding us back so that we can run with perseverance. Jesus set an amazing example for us. I want to finish my race well. And I want you to finish your race well. And I hope you know that you're in a place full of people that want to help you persevere. As we close and the worship team comes up, Frida's going to come up and pray a prayer of blessing over all the women If you're sitting next to your wife or mother, I'd encourage you to put your arm around her or hold her hand. If you're sitting next to a friend, I'd encourage you to put your hands on their shoulders. If you're not sitting next to anyone, please know that Jesus sees you and he loved you enough to consider it joy as he endured the cross. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you for every woman that is here today. 
And I pray for your blessing on our life. I pray that you will help us as women to run with perseverance and to keep our eyes focused on you. I would ask that your Holy Spirit would so work in our lives that there would be fruit of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and gentleness, faithfulness and self-control. Lord, let us be a reflection of you. And then, Father, I pray for that, those women who may be here and they're grieving today. I pray for your comfort. I pray for healing. I pray for your touch. And, Lord, I just uh, pray that we will be all that you want us to be. Encourage us, Lord. Help us to run the race well. In your name, Jesus. Amen.